Hello everyone and welcome to week 10. Today we're going to talk about Bayesian games. I'm David Smerden. Before we get into it, let's have a look at the little homework puzzle I gave you at the end of lecture nine. So this was from a very familiar game, Noughts and Crosses or Tic-Tac-Toe. And the deal was that you were going to play against Bill and Bill had already written down his guaranteed non-losing strategy on a piece of paper. And his strategy was as follows. If possible, play a move that wins immediately. If that's not possible, then stop any winning move for the opponent, which is us. If that's not possible, then play in the center. If that's not possible, then play in the corner. And if that's not possible, then just choose randomly. So on the surface, that seems like a pretty good strategy, pretty solid. And I think that generally speaking, that's the sort of strategy that most people play um, with this game. But it's not an equilibrium strategy. It's very close, but it's not. And what uh, the point behind this fun little game was, besides being a little brain teaser, uh, is that it shows that even small deviations off the equilibrium path can allow your opponent to exploit them in quite a big way. I mean, in this case, the outcomes are simply zero, one or a draw, which is a half. Um, but we can get, uh, we can show that our best response to their non-equilibrium play can give us a uh, good result. In this case, winning the game. So how do we do this if we move first? Well, the key is to play our first move in the corner. Uh, so what's Bob going to do? Well, he cannot play a winning move. We're not threatening to play a winning move, so he doesn't have to stop anything. So his formula says, uh, if one and two are not possible, then play in the center if possible. So what he's going to do now is play in the center. And now we play in the diagonally opposite corner. So again, uh, Bob can't play a winning move and he doesn't have to stop anything from us. He can't play in the center anymore. So we're down to this situation here where it says play in the corner if possible. Now, usually playing in the corner is a reasonably strong move. It just so happens though in this situation, playing in the corner, well, of course, we're going to stop him winning by playing in the corner, but now we have two threats. We have the oops. We have the threat across the top, and we have the threat down the bottom. And Bob can't stop both. He can try to stop one, uh, following his rule, but we'll clean up in the second go, and that's how we beat Bob. Okay, so let's move on to Bayesian games. What do we mean by Bayesian games? Well, so far we've been assuming that there's been informational certainty in our games. Both players know everything about the game and about the other players. Everything seems uh, pretty well known. Even if there are probabilities, those probabilities are known to both players. Both players are sort of even in terms of information going into their games. But of course, in the real world, this doesn't have to be the case. Let's take a fun sort of example from the Marvel series a uh, series of comics and in particular about Black Widow and the Hulk. Probably most of you are familiar with these characters if you've watched the Avengers at all or any of the other series. But essentially in this uh, series of Marvel comics and now movies, um, uh, the Black Widow, her full name being Natasha Romanova, is in love with a scientist called Bruce Banner. And Bruce seems like a pretty nice guy, very meek, sort of humble scientist. The problem is that this scientist has been exposed to large quantities of gamma radiation and just like the old literary classic uh, Jekyll and Hyde, uh, Bruce Banner transforms sometimes into a massive green monster they call the Hulk. Now these two are, are lovers, Bruce and, and Natasha, but the problem is that obviously um, the relationship is not so smooth when Bruce turns into the other guy, which he does always with some probability. So how could these two ever hope to coordinate when Natasha doesn't know who she's facing, Bruce or the other guy? Now, what is this other guy I'm talking about? Well, let's see if I can get uh, a 
an example for you up on the screen. How'd a nice girl like you wind up working in a dump like this? Fella done me wrong. Got a lousy taste in men, kid. He's not so bad. Well, he has a temper. Deep down, he's all fluff. Fact is, he's not like anybody I've ever known. I swear on my life, I will get you out of this. You will walk away and never ever. Your life! <laughs> So there we go, poor Natasha. She's got some issues to deal with with her man. Uh, and that's the sort of situation we're going to talk about um, in, uh, in this lecture, um, particularly situations in which Bruce may know which of his alter egos he's going to be at a given time, but Natasha doesn't. So what we've seen so far then are normal form games with perfect information, extensive form games with perfect information, and each player knows every player's action set and payoffs if we want to be very full. But now we're going to relax that assumption. So if information is imperfect but symmetrically imperfect in that whatever's not known is commonly unknown, um, then we can just use expected payoffs and sort of carry on business as usual as we've seen so far. But the difficulty is really when there's this asymmetric imperfect information. One player knows something, Bruce knows whether or not he's the Hulk at a given point in time, and the other player doesn't. So the player who has the information can choose an action based on this information, but the other player cannot make a choice contingent on information that he or she doesn't have. She has to try to account for all possible states uh, that the other person is in. Now, of course, this extends beyond two-person games, but that's the simplest case to sort of get us going. So we'll think about a battle of the sexes game, but we'll call this the battle of the moody sexes. So we've got um, we've got uh, Natasha as player one, and we've got Bruce as player two. Um, player two may be either happy or upset or if you like the marvel example we might have bruce we might have the hulk now if player two is happy then he wants to meet player one they want to coordinate get the usual sort of uh, payoff structure we see in the first uh the first box there on the left but if he's upset then he'd prefer actually to avoid meeting player one uh, and player two knows what his mood is, but player one does not. And as you can see, there are some probabilities put in there. So although player one doesn't know what player two's mood is, she does know the probability that player two is going to be happy. She does know the probability that uh, Bruce is going to be the Hulk once she runs into him. And we'll assume that at least this is commonly known, this sort of prior probability, which we'll refer to as alpha. So this sort of game is called a Bayesian game. Um, there are um, other forms where even this alpha is not known and we end up with this inf imperfect information game, but uh, most people sort of refer to these as different forms of Bayesian game. So we'll just stick to this term uh, Bayesian game. So the term comes from Thomas Bayes, who was actually around in the 18th century. He was a philosopher, he was a, a theorist in terms of probability, and 
by trade a Presbyterian minister, it turns out. And you might recognize him from this formula on the screen, which is a conditional probability formula that you might have learnt about in high school. The probability of A given B equals probability of B given A times probability of event A divided by probability of B. And while we use it in, in high school to look at conditional probability, uh, the real point behind this in terms of the game is how you uh, use new information that you're given to update the probabilities that you had before. So say you don't know what the weather forecast is going to be and you wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, well, it's Brisbane, the probability of rain is like 10%. That's normally what it is for Brisbane. You haven't checked the weather forecast and as you get out of bed and you go down to the living room, you see that your housemate is leaving for university and he's carrying an umbrella with him. Well, what does that do? Well, it updates your probability. You had 10% before, you see him with an umbrella, you sort of infer from that signal and you say, okay, now my new probability is 50% or something like this. So what are the elements of a Bayesian game and how do these differ to the games that we've seen so far? Well, a Bayesian game uh, consists of a set of players, as per usual, action sets, now that's the set of actions that are available to each player, type sets, so here we have some new terminology. These are the set of types of player I. For example, player two can be either happy or upset, and they capture the private information that a player has. Now, if we take the types of um, all players, so player two is happy, player three is upset, player four is happy and so forth and put them together, we get the type profile where we've got a type for each player. Um, payoff functions uh, are as per usual but they depend not only on the action profile but also on the type profile, they depend on that. Um, and then there's this prior which comes to the probability used by uh, Thomas Bayes. I'll just move my shoulders out of the way so you can see the full screen there. Um, so this is the prior distribution of probabilities that you assign to all possible type, type profiles. So for instance, Natasha Romanova wakes up in the morning and she says, um, normally on a given day, the probability that Bruce Banner turns into the Hulk is 30%. So I'm going to say there's a 30% chance it's the Hulk, 75% uh, 70 chance that it's Bruce. She looks out of the window and she sees that all of the cars on the street have massive dents in them and some of the buildings have been knocked down. She might want to update that probability of him being the Hulk to something else. And again, we can, um, we can put uh, this uh, as a term P, which is the probability distribution over all possible type profiles. Um, so for example, P of T we've got down here is the probability that player one has type T1, probability two has type T2, all the way through to probability that player N has type TN. Now, these types can be correlated, that does make our life a little bit more difficult, but we won't be going into too much detail about that. I'll discuss it a little bit later. So, in the variant of the battle of the sexes, the battle of the moody sexes that we saw before, the set of players, it's reasonably straightforward, it's one and two. What about the action sets? Well, for both players, there are only two possible actions they can choose, boxing and opera. What about type sets? Well, for player one, she's just got the one type. She's a pretty level-headed sort of woman, so it's just what it is. Player one doesn't have any types. It's for player two that things get a little bit more interesting. The uh, set of possible types for player two is made up of two options, two types, happy and upset. The payoffs are just given to us in the matrices and the prior is then the probability um, assigned by, by both players that player two is going to be happy, which we've seen is alpha. So when we look at the boxes, we can see the probability alpha down here and essentially that's saying, this is the probability that we will find ourselves in the box on the left. And one minus alpha is the probability that we will find ourselves on the box on the right. So how do we solve this sort of game? Well, let's try to tell the story at a different point in time. Let's suppose that um, Natasha and Bruce have decided that they're going to go out in the evening. 
Um, first they go off to their work, I guess their job is saving the world, but let's say it's different parts of the world, and they're supposed to coordinate in the evening, they don't have cell phones, they're either going to boxing or they're going to opera. Now, Bruce doesn't know whether he's going to be happy or upset. It depends what happens throughout his day. Let's say it depends what happens in the afternoon for him, which means in the morning, he doesn't even know whether he's going to be happy or upset in the evening. He just knows that for a given day, normally the probability that he'll be happy is alpha. And Natasha knows this as well. So they go to work separately. They're supposed to meet up uh, in the evening. Now, notice that the player two in the morning not knowing whether or not he's going to be happy or upset by just knowing the probability alpha is the sort of player two that Natasha thinks about even in the evening because she hasn't been given this extra information even by the time she gets to the evening. She still thinks that he may be happy, he may be upset, she doesn't know she's got that probability alpha. Now let's imagine that in the morning, player two's got to decide whether or not he's going to go out in the evening. Now, since he doesn't know if he's going to be happy or not, he needs to make these sort of contingent plans. Contingent plans meaning, if I'm happy, I'll do this. If I'm sad, I'll do this. Now, because there are two possible states of the world and two possible actions, there are four possible contingent plans that he can have. That is, if he turns out to be happy or if he turns out to be upset he can decide I'm going to go to boxing in either case likewise he can decide I'm going to go to opera in either case he can decide if I'm happy I'm going to boxing and if I'm sad I'm going to opera he can say if I'm happy I'm going to opera I'm sad I'm going to boxing so he's got these four possible contingent plans so how are we going to think about a pure strategy in this sort of game well, there are four possible contingent plans and a pure strategy of a player is one of these contingent plans of actions. Basically, it's like a formula uh, saying, if this is what I'm like, then I'm going to do this. And if this is what I'm like, I'm going to do this. So it's a pure strategy formula. Um, now, as in the extensive form game with perfect information, there's kind of a small difference here between actions and strategies, where strategies are taking into account this contingent information. Now, player one strategies here are essentially um, just actions, but player two strategies here take into account this conti contingency. So they have these two different elements in each one of the strategies. Sorry for the typo there uh, in strategies, um, which takes into account possible types um, that he might have. So now let's go back to the morning and let's think about things in terms of expected payoffs. For example, let's just take the case where player one chooses boxing and player two chooses the following plan, play boxing no matter what. So what does that mean? What are the expected payoffs in the morning to each of them? Well, we'll be considering these two boxes here, boxing and boxing, unintentional pun. So the utility to player one from player one playing this strategy and playing two playing this strategy is with a probability alpha getting the payoff of nine with a probability of one minus alpha getting the probability of three. We're basically taking into account probability and saying which of the left box, left payoff uh, matrix or right payoff matrix, terrible grammar, uh, are we in? And what about for player two? Well, it's just looking at those other numbers there. It's with a probability alpha of getting three and a probability of one minus alpha of getting zero. So that's pretty easy. Let's do another example. What if player one chooses boxing and player two chooses the plan boxing if happy and opera if not happy? Well, now we're still going to be in the top left box of the leftmost payoff matrix. But now if player two is upset, he's going to choose opera. So we're going to move across to the top right um, cell. So the payoff to player one in expected terms is going to be with an alpha probability of getting nine and a one minus alpha probability of getting zero. 
And for player two, it's going to be an alpha probability of getting three and a one minus alpha probability of getting three. So a total expected payoff for player two of three. And we can do the same for the other strategy profiles. Now, notice that in the morning, player one and player two have the same information. So both of them know that player two will be happy with the probability of alpha and upset with the probability of one minus alpha. And we've already figured out the set of pure strategies for each of them. And we know what the expected payoffs are. So if we've got that situation where we've got the expected payoff for each of them, for each strategy profile, we've got the set of pure strategies and they've both got the same information. That's exactly what we need to have for a normal form game. We have a normal form game. And just like we could transform an our extensive form game into its normal form equivalent, we can do the same for this sort of Bayesian game. So we can write out these contingent strategies here uh, for player two along the top. There are four of them. Oops, not a very straight line. And we can just put the two strategies for player one here as our rows. And we can start to throw in these expected payoffs. So what will we put in this top left cell? Well, what's the expected payoff to player one if player one chooses boxing and player two chooses the strategy profile boxing, boxing? Well, here uh, I've already substituted the probabilities for alpha out. So we've got a probability of two thirds that player two is happy and a probability of one third that player two is upset. So the expected playoff payoff for player one, if we get boxing for player one and boxing, boxing for player two, is going to be equal to, and here I'm gonna to try to draw this with my mouse, two thirds times this nine up here. So it's two thirds times nine plus one third times the probability of getting this three. So one, Whoa, no, I was doing so well. Here we go, see if I can finish this up. One third times three. Oh, that's ugly. Okay, so two thirds times nine is six. One third times three is one. So we're going to get a seven there. And what about for player two? Well, it's two thirds times three plus one third times zero. So that's going to be equal to two. So we're going to get a seven and a two in that cell. What about for the next cell going across? So boxing for player one and boxing and opera for player two. Well, again, for we'll start with player one again, it's going to be two thirds times the nine plus, let's see if I can do it a bit better this time, one third times, and now we're looking at the cell over here. This is the situation where um, player two is unhappy. So it's gonna be one third times zero. So that's just going to be a six. And what about for player two? Well, it's going to be two thirds times three is two plus one third times three is one. So it's gonna be a three. So we're going to end up with six, three. And I won't bore you with the rest. You can do it yourself, but we can fill out our normal form game now with all of these expected payoffs. That's reasonably straightforward in this case. We've only got two players. Only one of the player has got these um, uncertain types and there are only two types. So we've essentially taken the very simplest case that we can analyze. But it's reasonably straightforward to do and to do it for more um, complicated examples with multiple players, multiple types and so forth. Uh, we can write out the general form of it. So. In general, for the ex ante normal form, and we'll discuss what ex ante means in a moment, the set of players is the same. The pure strategy sets for, well, for player I, player I set is going to be the set of all possible actions that could be assigned for each of her types. So if happy, I could do this or I could do this. If sad, I could do this, I could do this, and so forth. We saw that there were four possible options for player two in the last example. And the ex ante expected payoffs are going to be equal to the payoff functions. That's what we're going to throw into our normal form equivalent. Now we saw how to get these expected payoffs in the simple case uh, on the previous slide. 
I'm going to write out now the complicated way of describing this in a general sense, but just know that the way we calculated it on the previous slide is exactly the way that we're calculating it. It's exactly what this formula says, it's just for the more general case. So what do we need to do these calculations? Well, for, for a given type profile, we need to know what these types are, and we need to know what the action profiles by type are going to be. So this is the strategy of player one given a type TI and the TI, sorry, T1, and the T1 is within this type profile T. And once we've got the strategies that each player is doing for their type, and we know what the types are, that gives us what the utility is going to be, in this case for player I. So that's going to give us the utility to player I for a type type profile given the actions for that type profile. But if we want to get the expected payoffs, then we're going to have to sum up all these possible utilities and weight them by their probabilities of these type profile occurring. So we multiply it by the probability of the type profile occurring, just like on the previous slide, we multiplied things by two thirds or by one third, depending on whether it was player two being happy or player two being sad. And then we add these things up across the type profiles. And that gives us our utility to player I, given a pure strategy profile S, um, looking at all the possible type profiles that can exist. So the total formula looks a little bit complicated, but it's essentially just what we did on the previous slide and then, extra, uh, previous slide and then extrapolating it to multiple types um, and uh, multiple players having these various types. In any case, once we have these ex ante expected payoffs and knowing what these set of pure strategies are, we have everything that we would need to be able to solve for Nash equilibria in a normal form game. So we can do that and indeed, what we call a Bayesian Nash equilibrium is just the Nash equilibrium of the associated ex ante normal form game. And we've just seen how to construct that on the previous slide. So looking at our simple example in the battle of the moody sexes, we've got um, what these, these, these strategies are, we've got what the payoffs are in terms of ex ante expected payoffs, and we can just solve for this in the usual fashion. And when we do this, we can find two pure strategy Bayesian Nash equilibria. The first is where player one does boxing and player two does boxing if happy and opera if sad. The second is when player one does opera and player two essentially sw switches these options, does opera if player one does, sorry, does opera if happy and does boxing if sad. Um, so those give us our pure strategy Bayesian Nash equilibria, which are nice. There is a mixed one as well, and we can find that again in the normal fashion. To find it, let's assume that P is the probability that player one goes to boxing and one minus P, the probability that player one goes to opera. And let's see if we can find this now. We're going to draw four lines on our graph in the normal fashion. So when we draw our four lines, we should know how to do this by now. They'll look like this. And now we're looking for mixed strategy equilibria. Well, it's clear that BB is never going to be in one of these because it's never optimal. We can always do better than that line. So we can rule that one out straight away. But if we rule that one out, then we know that player two must put a probability strictly between zero and one uh, on B zero as uh, B O not zero B O um, boxing opera. That must be the case. Otherwise player one won't be willing uh, to mix. Player one can always do better. So we've got boxing opera in our equilibria, but it cannot be the intersection of boxing opera with opera boxing because in that case opera opera would be strictly better so it's got to be this mix box boxing opera and um, opera opera and we can find where that mix is going to be it's possible only when p is equal to three uh, three quarters and in that case player two can mix between boxing opera and opera opera and now we want to find the other probability. So let Q be the probability that player two places on boxing opera, one minus Q on the other option, opera opera. 
for player one to be willing to mix, it must be the case now that um, the two payoffs from the two pure strategies are equal. So if player one plays uh, boxing in this example, um, she's going to get six times Q, Q the probability that player two plays boxing opera, plus zero times one minus Q. Um, one minus Q, the probability that player two plays opera opera. So that just boils down to six Q. If player one plays opera, then she's expected to get one times Q plus three times one minus Q. So that's this part over here. And what's the Q that equates these two payoffs such that player one is indifferent? Well, that's Q is equal to three over eight. And that gives us our mixed strategy equilibrium. I'll just move out of the way a little bit there. So the game has got three Bayesian Ash equilibria, two pure strategy ones that we found before, and that one mixed strategy one with the probabilities that we've just found about, that we've just found rather. All right, now when it comes to solving Bayesian games, it's important to think about the timing. There are three stages of Bayesian games that we could think about. There's the ex ante stage, the interim stage, and the ex post stage. The ex ante stage is a situation where all realizations of the types are unknown. There's still, it's still up in the air whether Bruce is going to be Bruce or the Hulk. There's the interim stage where we know for sure now whether Bruce is Bruce or the Hulk, but the Black Widow doesn't know that. Natasha doesn't know, but Bruce knows his own type. And then there's the ex post stage when they both arrive at wherever they're supposed to be and they see each other or they don't see each other and they call each other or whatever. But now everyone knows everyone's types. Most importantly, in this case, Natasha now knows what um, Bruce's type is going to be. So the normal form we've just constructed is considering things happening in the morning. And it's called the ex ante normal form because it looks at the strategic interactions and the choices between the two players before either knows the realization of his or her um, type. And by the way, if you continue with economics, you'll hear these terms quite often, ex ante and ex post. They're Latin for before the event and after the event. But we don't really have to think about analyzing all three of these possible stages. Obviously the ex post stage is not so interesting for us because then everyone knows the realization of the types which means we know whether we're in the left payoff matrix or the right payoff matrix. So we can just solve one matrix as we've seen many times before. But what about the relationship between this ex ante stage, which we've just solved, and the interim stage? Well, actually they're very similar. And the reason for that is that in equilibrium, suppose player two chooses some plan in the morning, say boxing opera, so it's an ex ante sort of choice. Now, if that plan is optimal, if that plan is optimal, then once he realizes his own types, he should want to go to boxing if he's happy and he should want to go to the opera if he's upset. So if it's an equilibrium in the ex ante stage, then it's an equilibrium strategy in the interim stage. Conversely, the other way around, if in the evening player two wants to go to boxing if he's happy and to opera if he's upset, then that would have been the optimal choice in the morning. In other words, an optimal equilibrium strategy for player two in the interim stage must be also in the ex ante stage. So in this particular game, then uh, we can think about those two things as being more or less the same. But this isn't always the case. And this goes back to the comment I made earlier about the interdependence of types. So when we're dealing with the ex ante normal form game here, we're just using these prior probabilities, both for Natasha and for Bruce Banner, they're both using this alpha. However, at the interim stage, a player now knows the realization of his or her type. And if types are correlated, which they could be, then finding out my type might change my probability assessment about another player's types. And that will affect the way that we look at this game. For example, imagine that Natasha has got the Black Widow Hulk as something that she can turn into as well. And say that they both have this fixed probability in the morning that they'll turn into their monstrous alter ego types. Well, maybe it's something to do with 
I don't know, gamma radiation that transforms them into these types. So in the evening, or if um, Natasha notices that she's transformed into her Black Widow Hulk, that's going to affect how she thinks Bruce's type is going to be. Oh, I got, I turned into my alter ego, um, and that's usually due to gamma radiation. Probably that means there's more gamma radiation around at the moment. So probably actually the chances that Bruce has turned into the Hulk are higher than I thought before. So the realization of my type affects my probability that I assign to the other player's type. In other words, the types are correlated. Having said that, we're not going to go too much further into this, just to say that one of the reasons that we've got this Bayesian term in Bayesian games is that we had a prior belief about the type of our other player, and now this new information allows us to update those beliefs. Um, but we won't be looking too much further about this. So let's look at a very famous example now of a Bayesian game, and it's called The Market for Lemons. It's very, uh, very well known in economics. Um, it's an application of what we've seen just before. We can analyze it in the interim stage, uh, and it's related to a very interesting uh, concept in microeconomics known as adverse selection. And adverse selection is very important for a lot of policy issues in economics, but also in uh, health and finance and so forth. It's any situation where you've got buyers and sellers and one side of the market knows the quality, but the other side doesn't. Um, so some examples of this have got to do with um, insurance premiums. You might say, for example, what sort of people are most likely to take out life insurance? And so a naive life insurance company would set its life insurance policies on the assumption that a random sample of the population takes out life insurance. And then they work out the probability, the average, what's the average age people live to, things like this, and they make their premiums that way. But of course, the sorts of people who take out life insurance aren't representative of the whole population. They're usually people who are more worried that they're more likely to die and that's going to affect um, those life insurance um, payouts for the company. Same thing, what sort of students at UQ are more likely to take easy courses versus hard courses? It's not just a random sample of the students, it's more likely to be students who think that they're going to struggle with the hard courses. Um, and what sort of people are more likely to swipe right on your Tinder profile? Uh, something to think about. But the most famous example is a little bit less uh, saucy than this. It's about cars, and in particular, secondhand cars. The secondhand car market being one of the most notorious for this problem about adverse selection. So let's set up the lemons game. By the way, a lemon, that's um, a slang term for a bad car. That's what we mean by, um, by a lemon. So there's a used car. Player one is a potential buyer who's interested in the car. Player two is the owner of the car. Player two knows the value of the car, of course, because player two has owned it. Player one does not, and has a prior belief that the value is distributed randomly between uh, zero and 100, let's say, for simplicity. Now, there are usually, spe uh, generally speaking, there are benefits from trade to both producers and consumers, you know, producer surplus, consumer surplus, and so forth. So we'll assume here that the car is worth more to player one than player two, which makes sense because player one is a buyer in the market, player two is looking to sell it. So we'll say the car will be worth 50% more to player one than player two. What about the actions and the payoffs? Well, player one can make a bid, we'll call that bid P, and it's somewhere between zero and 100. Um, nothing below zero makes sense, nothing above 100 makes sense if the maximum value of the car can be is 100. What can player two do? Well, player two can accept or reject that offer. And then what are the payoffs going to be? Well, uh, it depends whether or not the bid is accepted or rejected, of course, but if player, if the bid is, um, is rejected, let's start on the right column first. Well, player one doesn't get anything, so we'll just call that zero. Player two is left with the car and knows the car's value as V. What if the bid's accepted? 
Well, player two is going to get the price, which is P. Um, player one is going to have to pay a price P, but is going to get 50% more than the value of the car or 1.5 times V. So those are our payoffs. Now let's analyze the game. We'll start with player two who can accept or reject the offer. So we're looking at this from the interim stage. So that's when the types are revealed and in particular player two knows the value of the car, which is what we would imagine in the real world and is also uh, what we find for most applications of adverse selection, such as you go to buy life insurance or not, you already have some rough idea about your health and well-being, which the life insurance company does not know. So suppose that the value um, of the car is V and that's known to player two. How do we work out whether player two accepts or rejects or not? Well, if he accepts his payoff is P, if he rejects his payoff is V, so it's pretty easy. He's going to accept whenever the price is more than the value. That's simply what you do in any situation when you're selling a good. It's easier for us to think about this in terms of a cutoff strategy. Now we've seen cutoff strategies before. Remember the case of the island where everyone climbs up their tree to get a coconut? Well then there was a cutoff strategy again. We called it a threshold strategy of how high you were willing to climb. So here we'll think about player two strategies in the form that they'll accept all bids above a certain cutoff P star and reject any bid below P star. That's our cutoff strategy. P star of course is the cutoff. And that's going to make our life a bit easier because we can describe things in terms of just this one number, the cutoff. It's particularly useful in situations when a player only has these two actions. So for the coconuts example, it was climb or not climb. Here it's accept or reject. And for each possible action profile of the opponents, the difference in the payoffs from the two actions is increasing or decreasing in her type. Uh, in this case, um, Player one's actions, well, there are many, but it's offering prices between zero and 100 as we increase up the scale that is going to systematically increase the, um, the payoffs that we're going to get um, as player two. So let's go back to the lemons game then. If player two is going to accept whenever the price is greater or equal than the value, given this strategy for player two, What's player one's expected payoff when she bids P? So what I want you to do now, pause the video and see if you can work this out. Player one's expected payoff when she bids P. Pause the video now. Well, this was a really tough one. I don't know whether you would have got it right or not. I hope so. But I really wanted just to get you thinking about how you might solve this. So let's have a look. The payoff is going, the expected payoff is going to be the probability that the bid is accepted times the prop, times the payoff if the bid is accepted, plus the probability the bid is not accepted times the payoff if the bid is not accepted. Normal expected payoff formula. The difficult part is in this conditional probability component. So this here, this whole thing on the left is the expected payoff uh, in the case of where the bid is accepted. So it's the probability that the bid is accepted times the payoff if the bid is accepted. And then we can add on the other side, the probability the bid is not accepted, which is if the value is higher than the price times the payoff, which is zero. So this part's not so interesting over here, but it's this part here that's really important. So it's equal to the probability that the bid is accepted, which is the probability that the price is high enough, at least as high at the value, times the expected payoff to player one. The expected payoff is equal to the um, expected, uh, the expectation of three over two V minus P, which is the payoff from the bid being accepted. But the key point here is that the fact that the bid is accepted tells player one something about what the value is. If player two accepts the bid, then the car cannot have had a super high value. In fact, the car cannot have had a value 
higher than the price. Otherwise, player two would not have accepted. So the payoff is equal to the expected payoff that you get knowing that the value is no bigger than the price, knowing that that value is less than the price, uh, less than or equal to the price, taking that into account. That's the key point. And putting that all together, this conditional part, gives us the expected payoff for player one from a bid of P. So we can get rid of that right-hand side, like I said, because that's gonna be zero. We can also do a little bit of shuffling in the interior of this weird expectation uh, payoff function. So if we look at the, um, the expected payoff under here, so we've got three over two times V minus P. When we've got an ex expectation out the front, that's because something's got a probability attached to it. And what's got a probability attached to it? Well, it's not the P because we're offering the price. It's the V, we don't know what the value is. So the P doesn't actually need to be within that expected value component. So that minus P that's in there, we can actually take that out and shove it over to the right here because there's no uncertainty over that. We know what the price is that we bid. And we can just maintain that V in there. We can also take that three over two out the front as well. That's another constant, so we don't need that. So we're just, we're trying to simplify the expression for the term that has the uncertainty in it, that has this expectation. And that's useful because now we can apply some simple um, conditional expectation formula. So here are some of those. When X is a random variable that's distributed uniformly between A and B, and let C be some number between A and B, such that um, A is less than or equal to C, and B is greater than or equal to C, then the probability that X is less than or equal to C is equal to C minus A over B minus A. Now there are different ways to think about this. The easiest way is to just put some numbers in for A and B and do the calculations yourself. You can also think about it a little bit in terms of rectangles. This is gonna be a little bit tricky to draw, but I'll try to draw this now. So here's a, a rectangle where we've got our, oops, that was meant to happen. We've got our A here. What a great A that was. B over here. Think about the size of that rectangle there. And if we were to so that, say that A is zero and B is 100, for example, and we put an X in there, the X is 60. Um, so we'll put, we'll put say, uh, how am I gonna draw this? We'll put X equals 60 in here. Sorry, that X should actually be a C. I don't know how to change that. There we go. So we can think about actually kind of the size of another rectangle, another rectangle, and the size is going to be equal to C. And basically it's kind of like we're dividing the length of C over the length of B minus A, the big rectangle. So the probability that x is less than or equal to c is just basically the fraction where we take the length of the c rectangle divided by the length of the b minus a rectangle. Or to write it out numerically, it's equal to c minus a over b minus a. But it just means exactly the same thing. It's taking that fraction. So the smaller c is, the smaller that rectangle on top, the smaller that fraction is going to be. What about a situation where we want to work out the expected value of x knowing that x is less than or equal to C. So now we're just looking at that top rectangle, the rectangle that I've tried to shade but hasn't done a very good job of that. What's the mean? What's the mean of that rectangle? Well, the mean of that rectangle is just going to be exactly the midpoint of that rectangle. And what's the midpoint of that rectangle equal to? Well, it's equal to the total, um, the total length of that rectangle divided by two. In this case here, imagine that we've got A on the left here, um, we call that say zero for example, so it's just going to be C divided by two. 
So we're trying to just get the midpoint of that rectangle and that's the second formula, A plus C over two is that conditional expected value. I don't know whether my rectangles example made sense. It makes sense to me, but if not, you can just memorize these two formulae. So what we can do then is that we can use these statistical facts, these formulas on the previous um, slide, and we know what our A, B, X, and C are in these cases. A and B are just zero and 100. Um, our X is our V, that's the one where there's some uncertainty over it. And that C, that fixed part, that's our P, a bid that we're putting in. And we can just substitute these things into our expected payoffs formula. And what we do is we get this, we get P over 100 times three over two times P over two minus P. So what we really needed to find out was just this part here. And that's where we use these formulas from the previous screen. And we can simplify that. And in the end, we get an expected payoff of negative P squared divided by 400. So when player one bids P, she gets an expected payoff of negative P squared divided by 400. That's negative though. And player one can for sure get a payoff of zero just by bidding zero. So her equilibrium payoff must not be lower than zero. Um, and that means that in equilibrium, the only price that it makes sense to bid is equal to zero. In other words, even though in this market for secondhand cars, they can be cars of all different values, the only ones that are traded, the only ones that are going to be bought are those cars in very bad condition with the value of zero. So no trade is possible, even though as we know from microeconomics, there are benefits from this trade. Trade would have been efficient, but the market is not sorting this out. So adverse selection is one of a number of um, scenarios in which the idea from economics that markets are efficient, markets produce surplus, the invisible hand leads to the best outcome for society, those assumptions break down. Why is this happening? Well, it all comes to do with this tricky formula to do with conditional probabilities. And that is player one's not getting the unconditional value of the car, which is randomly distributed between zero and hundred. She's only getting the value of her car conditional on her bid being accepted, which means the range of values of the car has been squeezed. Those top valued cars are not there anymore. They're only, uh, they're only lower quality cars in her conditional, um, but because we're solving this at the interim stage, player two knows the realization of the car. So the only ones that are going to be traded by player two types are going to be those low value cars. In other words, we've got this self selection problem that only the bad types of cars are going to be sold. And that's why the concept is known as adverse selection. Now this is a very interesting topic uh, in its own in its own right. Um, in this particular reasonably simple example, it turned out that no trade was possible or only cars of a value of zero would be traded because of adverse selection. But we can make the model a little bit more complicated, a little bit more realistic, in which case some trade may still be possible. But in most scenarios, less than the market efficient amount of trade uh, will occur. It is also possible to set up some examples in which an adverse selection scenario is economically efficient. And this is very uh, interesting for policymakers. What are the tools that you can implement in these sort of markets where there's asymmetric information in order to get this efficient result? The original paper on this was actually um, published by um, George Akerlof back in 1970 in probably the best journal in economics, Quarterly Journal of Economics. Um, it's a very famous and reasonably straightforward paper to read as well. Um, but since then, the, this topic has um, exploded. Some of the many policy tools that are used to solve the issue of adverse selection um, involve things like warranties. The idea being that um, the, so that the adverse selection scenario is bad on both sides of the market, not just for the buyers, but also for the sellers who've got a good car, but they're not getting the high enough bids because the buyers are so worried about this adverse selection thing that they have to give in low bids because, because, of, this, um, because of this problem. 
So there are situations where there are buyers and sellers of high quality cars who would trade if they could only sort of prove to each other and set themselves apart from those lemon making cars. And one way to do this is by offering warranties. So uh, the high quality car, or you, you find this with um, you know kitchen goods and appliances and whatever, the high quality ones will try to set themselves apart by offering a five year warranty. 10 year warranty or something like this. Offering something that is too expensive for a low quality car to be able to match because they're far more likely to come into problems and break down and so forth. So for that reason, if the buyer sees a warranty, they get a stronger signal about the quality of this car, that it might actually have a higher value um, and therefore they're more likely to trade in that scenario. So warranties are a good example. Excesses in insurance markets, look at these things from the other side. Um, so things like health insurance sort of saying there's a, a $500 excess, meaning that if something bad happens, um, you have to pay the first $500 and then you'll get insurance after that. The idea being that that's hopefully going to stop only the risky behavior type people from coming in uh, to the market and buying insurance. Um, credit history checks as well, obviously um, a, a big issue at the moment. Trying again to get more information about the sort of person who's taking a loan from a bank or something like this. And no claim bonuses, particularly on things like car insurance and so forth. So if you don't have accidents for long periods of time, you'll get extra bonuses on your car that can be quite lucrative on, on your car insurance. Again, trying to encourage those um, low risk type consumers to come into the market. So that's about Bayesian, um, Bayesian games, situations where information is not perfect and particularly it's asymmetric. What we saw is that we can use ex ante normal form games um, to solve these for the most part, which makes our life a lot easier. And this topic has a very important real world application uh, for adverse selection, which is interesting for policymakers. All right, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I'll see you next time. Bye.